sure I can, yeah, here we go. If I tilt my head, I think we'll be, we'll be good. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I think I did a talk here, one of the first talks here about five years ago when they just moved um, the chapel over. So it's, uh, it's been a while, but uh, it's great to see so many history lovers. I'm a history buff, so I'm definitely preaching to the choir tonight because y'all are here and you want to hear about history and I'll, I'm all into that. Um, ha, has anybody seen the marker at Bull Memorial? Have, is anybody aware that it's been there? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's interesting that a lot of people don't know it's there. Um, it, was, it was one of those things I literally stumbled upon when my son was about five years old and we would take him to the swing sets there at, at Bull Park and I saw the marker. And I was, I was just amazed, and I knew right away that there was a story there that needed to, to, to be written. But what I did was, I did four stories, so I, I, I needed to research each person, and started with uh, Richard Bull, went to uh, Bob David, uh, or excuse me, Richard Bull, then John Ahern, Bob David, and then finally, Solomon Sturdivant has is, is been a story I've been chasing for years, literally years. There's, there's been really uh, little information on the internet about him. Finally, finally within uh, the last two months as we were nearing this, uh, this talk, I found sort of a, a mother load of information that was great. We found the first picture of him, uh, found out who his family was, why he was here. Uh, the Aherns, the Bulls, and the Davids were all residents of Atlantic Beach, but Solomon Sturdivant wasn't, so that was the, the harder search for me. Um, but uh, we're going to start with Richard Bull because I think a lot of people uh, know a little bit about him. Obviously, they know about the Bull name uh, here at Atlantic Beach. Uh, excuse me. Here's Richard. Um, Richard Bull was uh, the son of Harcourt Bull, who was the first mayor of Atlantic Beach. And Harcourt Bull was an Irish Canadian. He came from around outside of Ontario and uh, was nationalized American. Although he immigrated from Ireland, he came to Ontario first went to college there and then to law school in New York City. And so he was a corporate lawyer in New York City, very well known. Uh, he lived in, uh, on Staten Island where the Vanderbilts lived. He lived in like the same neighborhood. Uh, his house was like a mini McMansion. So he was very wealthy, uh, very well to do. Uh, before that, he lived in like Upper West Side Manhattan. Um, he was a corporate lawyer with uh, his clients were mainly in the transportation business. A lot of railroad clients, things like that. And Richard was born in 1914. He was one of uh, three bull boys, uh, Harcourt Jr., Richard, and then George. And um, all three were born in New York City. What happened was Harcourt was working with a lumber baron in New York, and the lumber baron was, was trying to finance the Atlantic Beach Hotel in the early 19, like 1914-1915. And Harcourt would have to come to Atlantic Beach to work with his client, you know, to, to meet with him, things like that, because that's where this, this lumber baron was. And he saw the area, he loved the area, he just thought it was uh, right for the picking, so to speak, as far as real estate uh, development. And he had quite a bit of capital. So the more he kept coming here, the more he, he realized, I just need to move my family here. And so he moved Richard, his three sons, and his second wife, his first wife died uh, in a fire. She was a concert pianist, and she died in a fire, and then he married her niece and she was about 30 years his junior. So Richard, George, and Harkar Jr. were all um, born with his second wife, and she was younger, she, she raised the boys here in Florida. 
And Harcourt, of course, went on to be the mayor of uh, Atlantic Beach in 25. And, and Richard was the second son. So all three sons at that time, there was when, when the heart when the Bulls moved here, there were probably a hundred people in Atlantic Beach. That's how many people lived here in like 1914. Uh, you know, it was just a, front, a frontier town. And he was able to buy up all a lot of land. And that's that's and he was an attorney, he knew how to who he knew how to do contracts. And he and Mr. Adams, who owned the Atlantic Beach Hotel, pretty much were the movers and shakers of Atlantic Beach. And so the boys uh, Richard and the two and the two other brothers were were schooled, sort of homeschooled by their mom here in Atlantic Beach, and also there was a school up in Baltimore that they did correspondence through, and so they did that until the, the three boys became high school age, and so Richard and and his two other brothers uh, grew up in this house right here, and it was on uh, Beach Avenue which is now the Hyannides house. And this is the old Christopher Bowl house. You can see the, the Dutch colonial architecture. Um, I think there was like a, uh, a commercial film there maybe 10 years ago, a famous, uh, it wasn't Ralph Lauren, but it was another sort of clothing. Uh, and they wanted that sort of old time Dutch colonial beach uh, mansion type look. And uh, the boys grew up there uh, and Richard and his two brothers all went to Landon because in, 19, in the early 30s, Fletcher hadn't been uh, inaugurated yet. It, it didn't open until 1937. So Richard and his two brothers all went to Landon. So I went down to Landon trying to find some uh, yearbooks for these guys, and basically Landon doesn't have anything. But I found a little tiny place up on uh, Atlantic Beach, or uh, on Atlantic Boulevard, where uh, the landed graduates all keep their yearbooks and everything in like a little, uh, uh, just a little storefront. And they had all the yearbooks. And so I found out that, uh, that Richard uh, was a uh, 31 grad of Landon. His, his brother Harcourt was a 30 grad and his brother George was 32. So they never, they never went to Fletcher, obviously. They went to Landon, took the train from Mayport to, to Landon, and got schooled there. And he, and Richard is about uh, 18 or 19 when he goes off to Georgia Tech. Harcourt goes to the University of Florida, and George uh, Jr. was at high school at Landon. And at that point, uh, Richard's starting to get an inkling for, for flight. He's starting to think about he wants to be a pilot. And, you know, I assume, I, this, isn't, this isn't fact, but I assume that um, I think he was motivated in those days by all the trans, uh, transatlantic, transcontinental flights that used to land at the beach here in, in the early 1900s. We had a lot of people that flew from San Diego and flew experimental planes that landed on our beaches here. And we did, I did a bunch of stories on that. And we were really an aviation mecca from like 1910 to about 1934. We had some of the world famous flights that came and they landed here at Jacksonville Beach because we had great long wide beaches and they could land and take off. And I'm, I, just, I just feel like maybe Richard uh, might have got some semblance of flight there and, and some love of flight. Uh, there is a, uh, a, lot, a lot of people may know of uh, the Bowl Airport in Atlantic Beach uh, at one point. Now that was, that was actually uh, developed after Richard died. It wasn't named, it was named for him, but, but it was after. And it's basically where one of the fairways in, at the golf course is now. But, so he probably didn't have any flight training here. He probably wasn't a private pilot. And so he went to Georgia Tech and may have gotten some aeronautical experience there. But in 1938, uh, long before you know, the war, uh, obviously there was war in Europe, there was the Blitzkrieg going on, uh, he decided to uh, enlist in the Navy. And he was in Miami at the time, according to uh, his uh, military records. 
and enlisted in the Navy in 1938, and, and just like today, all flight training was in Pensacola. So he went to Pensacola, he got his wings, which you can see there on uh, his left uh, uniform. And in this picture, it, he's pretty much an ensign because uh, if you know anything about the Navy, lieutenants always have two stripes on their, on their shoulder boards as opposed to the Army, which two stripes was a captain. And so the Navy is two stripes. One stripe is, one stripe is an ensign, and one stripe and a half stripe is a lieutenant junior grade. And that's what he ended up becoming after. So that, I, I assume that's his picture coming right out of flight school. He just got his uh, wings and he's getting ready to get his first duty station. And at Pensacola, he did two things. Number one was he got secretly married and apparently didn't tell any of his, his family for whatever reason, I don't know. And number two is he took out a life insurance policy. And remember, it's 1938. He, he knows he's going to be a pilot. He knows he's going to fly. And he knows maybe war is imminent, but, he, but he's not, you know, 1938, we're not really talking about war in the U.S. We have that national attitude that we're going to stay out of it. So he probably thinks he's just going to be in it for a couple of years or whatever. But he does take out a life insurance policy. And we're going to talk about that as we go later on. But it's very important that he did that. Um, he buries secretly in his first duty station of all things, Pearl Harbor, 1940. So here's a guy who starts the war basically at the epicenter of World War II, obviously not knowing it. He got to Pearl Harbor in, uh, in 1940 and, uh, and he became a, a, plane, a patrol uh, uh, I'll get the uh, plane up here for you. He became a uh, plane captain of what's called a PBY Catalina. And basically, this is a flying boat. Uh, it is a, um, it's also almost like a biplane. But in those days, uh, uh, we were, we, we had no, we had no planes that could cover long distances uh, across vast oceans. We needed a plane that could do that because the Pacific was vast. Um, we needed to do a lot of reconnaissance in the Pacific. And we need a plane that can do that. And this is in the days before radar. So basically, these planes went out and just eyeball, just scouted vast uh, areas of ocean looking for ships. And so his main job and, and, and any pilots on a PBY were to go out and do sector searches in the Pacific, look for the Japanese carriers, the Japanese U-boats, whatever. And that was their mission. And believe it or not, uh, they were armed. They had uh, four uh, machine guns on board, two 50 calibers and two 30 calibers. They also had a couple of bombs that they had, and they also had depth charges. So if they could see, if they saw a carrier, or if they saw a destroyer, uh, they would radio that position, and then they would drop their bombs and then try to get out of there. The problem was, this was a very slow airplane. Uh, Maximum speed was probably 190 miles an hour. It was a very lumbering plane. Its job was to go out and find people. It wasn't to engage. Uh, and so it was right for the picking for any fighter jet that the Japanese would have. And so uh, 1941, Pearl Harbor happens. Basically, all the PBYs that were stationed in Pearl, Pearl Harbor are destroyed, uh, or at least uh, you know, knocked out. Uh, and so uh, what's interesting is he ends up in the Dutch East Indies, which is where Bor uh, Borneo is. If you know where that is, it's, it's, it's south of the Philippines, sort of southwest of the Philippines, close to Australia. And what happened was, is the Japanese, before they went to Pearl Harbor and, and bombed Pearl Harbor, they realized that they needed oil and they needed oil to run their aircraft carriers, their planes, their everything, their tanks, everything. But they were not an oil-producing country. 
And at that time, the Dust East Indies were actually the fourth largest oil producing country in the world. Uh, these little islands in the middle of nowhere had a tremendous amount of oil and they had rubber plantations, two things that the Japanese needed. So in reality, they wanted to invade the, dust, the, the Dutch East Indies first, but they knew if they did, America would come into the war right away. So they said, let's go ahead, let's go to Pearl Harbor, take out all their, all their uh, boats, all their aircraft, or not all their aircraft, but all their ships, and then we can go to the Dutch East Indies, take the oil, and then work our way back and take the Pacific. And it was, a, you know, it was, it was a, it was a plan that, that worked. I mean, it caught us off guard. Luckily, we didn't have all our battleships, all our uh, carriers in Pearl Harbor that day, and and we we skirted that. And so, once they did Pearl Harbor, they went straight back to the dusty, uh, the Dutch East Indies, and they wanted to take these islands. And and here's the thing is, because we lost so many planes, so many ships, everything at Pearl Harbor, we couldn't get any of our, any of our uh, uh, planes or ships to the dusty East Indies to stop these Japanese aircraft carriers from moving east. And so these PBYs were really the only things that we could scuttle up, get out there, and search these waters and at least uh, you know, find these people, or find these aircraft, and, or find these out of ships and say, okay, here's where they are, uh, you know, they're coming, we can, we, we pinpointed them, and that's the best we can do until we can get ships out there. And so that's what his mission was, and so here's a guy who enter, enters the war to be a flight, uh, to be a pilot, ends up in Pearl Harbor on, on the day of, uh, of of that and then ends up in probably another worse scenario. He has to go to this remote island area in the Pacific in this lumbering plane and and basically spot aircraft carriers radio and then hope, hope that he's not shot down. And so uh, these PB, PBY pilots really sort of knew that you know they weren't going to have a lot of help that that their job was to to basically open the war. They were the first people uh, in the war to really stop the Japanese. And our time frame at this point is really uh, about a month after Pearl Harbor. He is sent to the uh, East Indies with his squadron of PBYs in, uh, in early January. And by that time, all the PBYs that are in the East Indies have been basically destroyed, shot down, uh, blown up, you name it, and the Japanese are just making their uh, move into the into these islands. They're taking over, they're, they're uh, making amphibious assaults, and they are taking these islands one by one. And, and, and it, as you know, in World War II, that's what the Japanese did. They just island hopped all the way across the Pacific until we stopped them. And they took and took and took until we started taken back. And so this was the first really skirmish in the, in the war, and Richard Bull was, was knee deep in it. And so by the time he got to, uh, to uh, these islands, uh, right away, within 24 hours, he was flying missions and, and, and trying to spot these, air, these aircraft carriers, these, these destroyers, cruisers, you name it. And one of his first missions he stayed on the station long enough that he spotted 26 uh, Japanese ships, radioed that in, um, which was uh, very crucial, you know, to spot these ships, and then dropped his bombs, got shot up a little bit, but was able to get back to his base. And the great thing about these Catalinas is they didn't need runways. All you needed was ocean, so you could land and take off on, on the ocean. Basically, they were deployed from a, a tender, a ship tender, that would just drop them into the water, and then they would take off and land. They didn't have any kind of landing base, no, no uh, airport or anything like that. And, and so, uh, about two weeks later, uh, it's about February 5th, and Richard has been in the uh, East Indies for possibly uh, a month by then, his squadron that came over with 12 planes, there was about five left. And three of them went on a mission uh, that night, on February, or that day on February 5th, 
looking for another uh, aircraft carrier that was eminent in the area and was known to be there. And his mission, you know, do or die, was to go out and find that aircraft carrier, spot it, uh, radio back in its position, and then hopefully get back to the base. And unfortunately, that's not what happened. Uh, once he did spot it, he, uh, he, he dropped his bombs and immediately uh, fighter jets attacked his, his airplane. And the PBY uh, had 10 crew members on it. It was a big plane. It was almost like a B-17 with about 10 crew members. It had a ball turret, or it didn't have a ball turret, but it had, like I said, four gunners, uh, co-pilot, pilot, navigator, flight officer, full crew. And so, you know, at 190 miles an hour, you're not gonna you're not gonna speed away from a, a, a Japanese fighter pilot. And so, what happened was that one of his engines was shot out, and he made it to the island where he was based, but only close enough to land into the ocean. Landed into the ocean, uh, ordered everybody out of the plane, and they got their life lifeboats, jumped in them and got away. Uh, a number of people in the plane uh, died from the Japanese swooping down and strafing the plane. And Richard stayed in the plane and destroyed as many documents, as many radios or whatever he could uh, because he was, you know, he was the commander. And as uh, he was doing that, uh, and why we know this is one of the survivors uh, Lieutenant Hargraves, who was the co-pilot, had jumped into a raft with another, uh, another, another crew member, and they could see Richard on the wing of the plane uh, inflating a raft. He was getting ready to leave. But at that point, a Japanese fighter came down, swooped down and strafed the plane, meaning uh, sort of machine gun the plane. And as you know, the plane had lost an engine, was leaking fuel. Basically, all the fuel around the plane was, you know, wasn't on fire, but one little match, and that would have been it. And so, uh, when the plane came down and strafed it, both Lieutenant Hargrave and the other uh, crew member dove, dove out of the raft into the water. And the next thing they heard underwater was an explosion. And when they popped up, all they saw was one wing of the plane burning and Richard, Richard uh, Bull was nowhere to be found. And so uh, when, when he was awarded the, uh, when he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for that action, uh, it's hard to read that, but what it says basically at the bottom is that he died and everybody on, in his crew died, all 10 people. And in, in fact, what happened was Lieutenant Hargrove and the other crew member actually rode that raft all the way to Australia. And they were missing in action for a long time. So this, this uh, flying medal that Richard Bull was awarded was awarded way before that. And so when Hargrove finally made it back to his unit, he told the real story. He told, uh, you know, the, the heroism that happened with uh, Richard Bull, and um, and that's how you know the story got back to the Bulls here in Atlantic Beach. It just so happened that remember, as we talked about, Richard was secretly married. Um, that's when they found out that he had a wife and a four-month-old uh, son at that point. And they flew, they not flew, but they came back to Atlantic Beach and stayed with the Bulls after uh, Richard died. And Hargrove was uh, just enamored with young Richard Jr. and wanted to do everything he could for, for the son, for the grandson. And so when the, uh, when the widow, Ruth, uh, tried to uh, you know, get money from the insurance company, they, uh, he had taken, Richard Bull had taken out a $10,000 life insurance uh, uh, claim, uh, it was basically denied by the company. And, and so Harcourt was an attorney, you know, he went to town, hired the best attorneys, they went to district court, and the district court overturned that decision and they were awarded the money. However, the insurance company wasn't done yet. They appealed that decision 
and took it all the way to the U.S. Uh, uh, Court of Appeals in Illinois. And this is 1944. Uh, at, at that time, a year before that, though, Harcourt had died in a car crash in uh, Atlantic Beach. And he was 85 at that time, so he could no longer help her. However, she had attorneys. And what basically happened was that it, he did have a life insurance policy. And it did say that, uh, you know, in the event of, you know, death by airplane, you know, he was covered. However, there was not a war clause in his, in his uh, insurance policy. And so, even though he, he, he flew in a plane, landed in an ocean, and died, you know, on the wing of that plane, the company would not uh, pay, and, and basically the, the, the Court of Appeals upheld, upheld, the, uh, upheld that uh, judgment because he died as a, as, a, uh, as a means of war and not a means of flight. The plane, although the plane traveled, he politely traveled in the plane, and the plane landed him on the ocean, he died because of war, and there wasn't a war clause. There was a flight clause, but not a war clause. So Ruth, uh, his widow, ended up getting like $266 from that plane, as opposed to the $10,000. And, uh, you know, luckily, uh, her will had money, and, and she was taken care of. In, uh, after after he was uh, he got the medal. In 19, I'm always going backwards. In 1943, uh, that's when Bull Park was inaugurated, and I'm sure you, you recognize this. This is what what is, what is now the Adele Bridge Cultural Center in Atlantic Beach where they have plays, where you see acoustic nights, um, there's a tennis court, all that, that's the same area, and that's why it's known as Richard Bull Park, and that is George Bull on the right, the uh, younger brother uh, who was there, and I assume that Harcourt, who died in 1943, uh, that's why he's not in the picture, because uh, Harcourt Sr. as well. Yeah. That's why he's not in the picture, and that's why George is there. And uh, as you can see, and you saw in the earlier picture, Richard was a, a very handsome man at land, and all the girls were nuts about him. And uh, he had copper, sort of copper red hair, and was a good swimmer. And you can see George, very good looking. And so the Bulls uh, were obviously uh, uh, wanted something to to remember Richard by, and so the park has been has really been that has been that name there since uh, 1943, and they the marker which we'll talk about later that was 1946 when they put all four men on there. Uh, yeah, and I, that's what, I thought it was a Cub Scout too, but they, they in the picture these are all pictures that are in our archives by the way here at the museum, and he's identified as a. Uh, as a Boy Scout. It definitely looks like a Cub Scout, but maybe in those days that's what the Boy Scouts look like. Uh, the name is on the uh, on the picture in the, in the uh, I didn't recognize the name as it's anyone, you know, anyone local uh, as far as that's concerned. Our second guy is Bob David and and, you know, we're, we're, we're going to go, we're going to span from Pearl Harbor all the way to a month before uh, VE Day in Europe with these four men because that's how long their, their careers span in the war. And Bob David, uh, just like uh, Richard Bolt, he started uh, his career in the military in 1940, 1942, which was early for, you know, a lot of people. And... He was born in Jacksonville, and his father owned what uh, uh, this gentleman recognized. And I've seen this picture in the archives for years, and uh, it's an old filling station uh, on Atlantic Boulevard. 
And uh, Bob David's uh, father owned that, and he and his uh, sister, you know, pumped gas every day before they went to school with Fletcher. Uh, they lived. They also it was it was sort of like part gas station, part motel. They called it the tourist camp. It was David's uh, tourist camp on Atlantic, on Atlantic Boulevard, right about where Sherry Drive is. So right about where the McDonald's is, it faced Atlantic Boulevard, and they had their home there. And uh, Bob David played on the first football team at Fletcher. He was the center, uh, a really a hard scramble young man, tough as nails. Uh, you know, he, he pumped gas in the morning before school, pumped gas in the evening after school, worked all weekend delivering oil. Um, some of you that grew up in, at that time, you knew what it was like. You, you worked and worked and worked and, and went to school, and that's the way life was. And he was indicative of that kind of individual. And um, he graduated from Fletcher in 1940. And right away, he joined the Army in July of 1941 and went to basic training in uh, Camp Wheeler, uh, Georgia. And at that point, uh, at that time, an officer came up to a bunch of the uh, recruits in uh, training camp and they said, I'm looking for men for a new outfit, outfit called the Paratroopers. And Bob David was one of the first people to walk up to the man and say, I'm your man. You know, you know, I want to do this. And, and, and at that point, America had never had paratroopers. Actually, we kind of stole that from the Germans. They had paratroopers in World War I. And we, we saw that. We saw what they had done. And we, we said, you know, we need paratroopers for World War II. And if, uh, if uh, many of you have seen Band of Brothers, you know about the 101st Airborne. If you seen a lot of World War II movies, you know about the 82nd Airborne. Well, the first ever paratroop division was called the 509th, and that's where Bob David was. So he was actually a pioneer paratrooper, one of the first ones ever. And believe it or not, uh, the first time we jumped paratroopers in World War II wasn't at Normandy, where most people think, but was in North Africa. And Bob David and the 509th uh, parachute uh, regiment were those first paratroopers that made combat jumps into North Africa in 1943. So his war started in 1943. And they jumped into Algeria. They jumped into Tanzania. He battled on the ground at a place called the Kazarine Pass in North Africa, which was one of Rommel's first big victories. And it was our first defeat in World War II. Uh, from then on, he went to uh, uh, Salerno in, in Italy. Once we once we took North Africa, our, our army moved into North into Italy, and the paratroopers also led the way in, in Italy. So he jumped into Italy. Uh, that was his third combat jump. Uh, they also uh, jumped, or they also. His division, uh, or his unit, also participated in the famous amphibious uh, assault on Anzio, which was, uh, I think, a movie probably. And then one more time, he jumped behind the lines in Italy uh, at a place called Avellino, and was behind the line for, behind enemy lines for possibly two to three weeks, because paratroopers in those days were sort of like the SEALs, were sort of like the Delta Force. They were the guys that were behind the line. They were light infantry. They they lived on their wits and destroyed whatever they could, and then got back to the got back to the uh, to our lines. So by the time he's he makes it to Rome with his unit in in March of 1944, he's been in he's jumped and survived four combat jumps. He's been on two uh, amphibious assaults. He's, he's, uh, in those days, infantrymen acquired points in order to go home. And you had to acquire 84 points if you were a, an infantry soldier in Europe. And once you acquired 85, you were allowed to go home. Um, unlike you know, today's 
uh, deployments and then like deployments in Vietnam, which were a year. And in World War II, a lot of you went to war and you came back when the war was over or you got the points or you're injured or whatever. And so he had accumulated about 120 points at one point uh, in 1944, but would not leave his unit, which was sort of indicative of the camaraderie in, in many units, not just the paratroopers, but in all branches. You know, anybody that's in a team, you never want to leave your brothers or your sisters. And Bob David did not want to come home. And so, uh, of course, in, in D Day, June 1944, we invaded Normandy, and that's when the 101st jumped into battle. The 82nd jumped into battle. Uh, Bob David's unit was held in reserve because uh, what we had next was called the invasion of southern France. Northern France was, Nor was Normandy, southern France was in the Saint Tropez area, the Nice area, and that was our next big campaign to move through southern France up into the Rhineland and take Germany. And so Bob David and his unit were on the first planes to uh, lead the invasion of southern Flint, uh, France and they went across the Mediterranean and were, were to be dropped right on the beaches of Saint Tropez. Unfortunately, uh, in that vanguard of, of planes, and he was one of the, he was in one of the first ones, when they got the green light to jump about 4.30 in the morning, unfortunately the pilot uh, misjudged where he was and all the paratroopers on that plane jumped in, in, right into the Mediterranean Sea and drowned. And it was just, you know, a terrible thing. The guy had, had, had survived so much and, and to die that way was, was just so heart-wrenching for his family back here in Neptune Beach. And uh, I ended up meeting his sister, Ray, who was uh, also a Fletcher grad, and she lived to be 92. And I met her down in Fort Lauderdale, and she, uh, you know, she, like her brother, had worked at this gas station, and she, that's where I got these pictures. This is Bob before he went over to Europe. Uh, he's in the backyard in their house where it is, uh, looks like the teeds, looks like he's got a canteen there. And, and also, this is Bob right here, uh, number 19 on the 1938 football team. Um, and number 16, that's Otis Fox who died in Iwo Jima, another, another Fletcher uh, graduate. Uh, most of these guys all went, 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 to, uh, went to the service. And this is his sister Ray, who I met, and that's Bob in their backyard right before he goes to Europe. You can see the shiny boots of the paratroopers, the, uh, the parachute uh, uh, curved wings that he got, that's his badge. And, uh, and I met Ray and she had these pictures. These were the first pictures we ever had of Bob David. And, and she loved her brother incredibly, and you know she just never saw him again. She saw him ship out, and that was it. And uh, every time I'm at the beach, I always think that that there's Ray standing at the beach, looking you know across that infinite sea in Atlantic of uh, the Atlantic Ocean, and thinking you know my brother's over there, and one day he's going to come back. And I'm sure there's so many families here that thought that because we lost a number of uh, beaches uh, men that went overseas and never came back and their families all they had was that ocean to look for and think that one day you know that my son's over there and one day he's coming back but you know Bob David never did but uh, but Ray really filled a lot of holes in for me and gave me a lot of information for that story and uh, and so uh, and it was an education for me because I never knew of this unit that was before the 101st. And it's a really a little known unit. I'm surprised that, that nobody's ever talked about it or anything, but they were the pioneers of paratroopers and Bob was definitely uh, one of those pioneers. These are a couple of his medals uh, that Ray had in, in her house in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, 
He has, he, Bob had three Purple Hearts, two before he died. Um, also, uh, those are the two Purple Hearts, and um, he ended up also getting a Bronze Star. If you can, you probably can't see that program, but it says Merry Christmas 1941, the 504th Parachute Battalion, Fort Benning, Georgia. So that, that's how far back this unit goes, 1941 um, Christmas. And so this is after Pearl Harbor. He's already, he's already training, just like Bolt. He's already in the thick of it. So we've got two men in Atlantic Beach that are already in the thick of the war at that, at that point. And this was one of the great things that, that came out of this story. I was able to go and, and tell Ray in, in, in Fort Lauderdale that even though her brother never came back, that the French people remembered the sacrifice. And, you know, that's why, you know, Normandy, every year the French people turn out to, to celebrate our sacrifices on D-Day. Uh, and that's why we have all these cemeteries in Europe, because the French people, the Belgian people, they love us because we liberated them. And, uh, and they knew the story of what happened to that one plane that that jumped into the Mediterranean, or those that one that one uh, group of men that jumped into the Mediterranean. So they erected this uh, memorial on San Tropez, on the beach, and it lists all the names of the men on that uh, on that plane. And Staff Sergeant Robert David is about the fifth one down, the only one from Florida. Uh, and I was able to bring that picture back to Ray. And, you know, I think we both cried at that point, but uh, it was a, it was heartwarming for her to know that. And, and this was like 2001, so you know, a little bit of closure there for her, which was great. And, uh, and it, it, it really was a capstone to that story. Um, what do you think Phil means? Is that Philadelphia or Philippines? The two towards the, towards the bottom. The fourth and fifth from the bottom. Yeah, interesting. I, that's weird. One has I never, yeah, I never noticed that. I don't know what that is. Because they're mostly all states. Yeah. Um, you know, the, no, the names are not indicative of, of the Philippines, yeah. so could be Philadelphia, and they didn't realize that Philadelphia was the city, not the state. So, yeah, we had a copy of it in there on that one. All right, um, we just passed the halfway point. We're at John uh, Jack Ahern. Uh, uh, does anybody remember Fred Ahern, the, the, the realtor here in, in, uh, in Jacksonville Beach for a long time? This was his young. This was his older brother, and. Um, Another, another great uh, guy who uh, gave up his time to tell me about this story uh, after I found that monument and uh, wanted to find out more about who these people were on this monument. And uh, if you remember that football picture that we had with Bob David, uh, Jack was the manager on that team. He was the football manager, he was the basketball manager at Fletcher. He wasn't a big kid like Bob was. Uh, but uh, a good student, and he loved sports, and so he was the manager of many sports at Fletcher. And like Richard Bolt, he also had a love for flying. And so uh, before and after he graduated from Fletcher in 1941, even though his father, like Fred, was in real estate in Atlantic Beach, he did not want to do that. So he worked at uh, NAS Jacksonville and worked as a uh, timekeeper and on a survey crew out there. And, and finally, uh, he also enlisted in the Army. And, but in, in back in those days, there was no Air Force. It was called the Army Air Corps. And so he enlisted as an enlisted man, as not as a, uh, a pilot, and was an enlisted man for about two years in the Army Air Corps stationed in the U.S. And as we started building our air forces, you know, training our pilots and getting ready for the big air war, which really was the Euro European theater. We didn't have as much air war in the Pacific. And so uh, 
uh, Jack Ahart uh, was an enlisted man for two years. And, and then in March 1944, he applied to become a flight officer and a pilot. So then I assume he was trained here in the US because most of the, the B-17 pilots were. And uh, actually, there was a B-17 uh, uh, training center down in Sebring, Florida, which is now where the racetrack is, where the 12 hours of Sebring are. That used to be a big B-17 base. Maybe he was trained there, I don't know. But um, he became a pilot, got his wings in 1944, and he was also married at the time. And he came back to Atlantic Beach, and, and before he shipped out from England, which was going to be his base where all the B-17 bombers went, uh, bomber pilots went, he and Fred went on a bike ride down Atlantic Beach. And Jack, Jack Ahern told his, his, old, his younger brother, Fred, he goes, you don't have to worry about me because I'm not going to be a hero. I'm going to come back home. You know, I got a wife, and I'm going to come back, and Atlantic Beach is my home, and you know, this is where I'm going to live the rest of my life. And so his his squadron and all his uh, bomber group went to England in uh, 1944, and uh, and basically was stationed right outside of London. Uh, north of London, where a lot of airfields, where all these B-17 bombers were. And if you remember the movie Memphis Bell, that's the kind of plane I'm talking about. It's a big plane, it's a bomber, it's got a 10-man crew. Uh, it's basically, its job is to go to Germany, drop bombs on oil fields, on, on any industrial sites. And, uh, you know, it had a lot of, lot of men in it and needed a lot of... A lot of uh, maintenance, things like that. These, these ships were always being shot down out of the skies. And so Jack Ahern knew what he was getting into, but like he told his brother, you know, I'm not going to be a hero. You know, I'm just going to do what duty and come home. So he gets to England in, uh, in September of 1944, and uh, he flies uh, in his first B-17 flight, uh, not a combat mission, but you know, takes the plane up, uh, with his crew, does a second flight, takes the plane up with his crew, does a third flight, takes the plane up with his crew, yet, yet has not gone on a combat mission. And so, uh, you know, he's, he's working his way up there, working up uh, his way up the ladder. And finally he gets, he gets the call to do his first combat mission on uh, December 16, 1941. He's the pilot. Uh, He's the head of the, head of the plane, and uh, their, their job is to go to uh, Stuttgart and bomb uh, uh, the marshalling fields there. And this is a huge vanguard of, of B-17s, just like you'd see in the movies, those giant Vs. This is just a huge V of B-17s that take off from the base in England. And, and this is his first flight, and so he is on the outside of the V to the right. And as, as they take off, they get up to about 7,000 feet, and one of the engines blows. And so they do everything they can to keep the plane aloft, or at least keep it in formation so that they can complete the mission. But because the engine is blown, the oil is, is leaking, the oil pressure has gone down, and the drag of the wing is actually taking the plane out of the formation and basically they just have to sort of bail right out. And at that point Jack makes the decision, we've got to go back to the base because we have bombs. You know, we can't, you know, we can't drop these bombs on in England. At that time, at that point, no American bombers were allowed to unleash their bombs, whether they were crashing or whatever, on English soil. You either ditched it in the English Channel or or whatever, but you, you weren't allowed to drop your bombs. And so they turned the plane around and uh, they 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 went to the close they tried to make the closest air base in England they could. And at that point the airplane is losing uh, is losing altitude probably five hundred feet per minute. So it's just dropping. And Jack A. Jack A. Hearn uh, releases the controls to the co-pilot, uh, 
why we know this is the co-pilot clip. And Jack gets with the navigator, and, and they're plotting the best course, the most direct course they can to get to this airbase. And as they keep dropping 3,000 feet, 4,000 you know, 4, feet, 3,000 feet, they, somewhere along the line, Jack realizes they're not going to make it. So at 2,000 feet, he tells everybody to bail out. And everybody bails out but the, the, the co-pilot, the lieutenant, uh, Barley. And, and Jack goes, go ahead, I'm coming right after you. And Jack gets up, puts on his, on his uh, uh, parachute, and that's the last thing Lieutenant Barley sees. He jumps out with the navigator, uh, probably 2,000 feet, you know, and um, and off goes Jack Ahern in the, in the crippled plane, full of bombs, in the fog at 2,000 feet with a with an engine that's going down. And apparently, somewhere along that line, he made that decision that you know, okay, I'm not going to be a hero but I'm not going to drop these bombs on English soil. So as he passed over a little town of about a thousand people in England called Boser, uh, in the fog, all he saw was a, a spire of a church. And he knew that he couldn't hit that church. And he knew that the town was there. And so even though it was foggy, so he cleared the church and then landed the plane in a field uh, in a farmland uh, called Red Gables Farm, and he felt like that was his only way. Is if he could land the plane, maybe, maybe not only would he live, but the bombs would not go off and would not destroy anything. And unfortunately, both those things happened. The plane, upon upon in, uh, impact, exploded. He died and was thrown from the plane, and the bombs just went off everywhere. However, no one was killed. Uh, basically, a few farm buildings were destroyed. All the windows, maybe in the town, were blown out. Uh, but uh, nobody died. Actually, the, the farmer that was in the on the farm, they heard the plane pass over. Uh, his wife and their children went out on their front lawn, laid down on the ground as the plane came over, and watched it. You know, just go into the into the land and, and blow up. They all survived, and uh, they, you know, they, they couldn't leave. Uh, the great thing about this is that the church was full at the time. It was a Sunday. It was 11 a.m. And had he hit the church, everyone would have died. And what happened was the church, when they realized what, 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 he, what the sacrifice he made, um, everybody in the, this little town of Bosra went out and took money to purchase a reef for Mr. and Mrs. Ahern back in, in uh, Atlantic Beach. And they delivered the money to the commander of the squadron, who was uh, Jack's uh, battle uh, bomb group. And the money, you know, and the money came back, and they bought the reef, reef for the family. And the church also uh, put a memorial. For Jack inside that's still there today and there's actually a stained glass window uh, in, in that church we really don't have anything but let, let's say these stained glass windows there's one stained glass window where there's a spire of the church and in the corner is a little B-17 bomber passing over it and so if you go in that church today you'll see that and, uh, and on every Easter there's uh, an Easter lily that's placed for Jack A. a Hearn. Uh, there's a plaque outside that always has flowers for Jack A. Hearn because the, the, just like uh, Bob David and San Tropez, this town believes that they're, they have a town today because of what uh, Jack A. Hearn did. And, you know, all, <coughs> excuse me, all, all those, you know, he told his brother, I'm not going to be a hero. It's too bad. He was a hero. And, uh, and a hero at 22, of all things. So that was his story. And uh, before we get to Solomon, uh, I, should, I should bring this up. He was married. He had an eight-year-old daughter. And so he was buried in, uh, in an American cemetery in England. And then after the war, his widow had his body reinterred 
in a national cemetery in Duluth, Minnesota, right outside St. Paul. And she is also buried there. And, you know, I wish I could tell you what happened to, uh, to their eight-month-old daughter, where she is. I just never, uh, you have to find that information, just like I don't know what happened to Richard Bull's four-month-old son and where he, where he went. But, uh, uh, so Jack was brought back. And, um, and, of course, we'll talk about the streets that they named after that. And our, our, last, our last hero is uh, Solomon Sturdivant, probably the least known of the four. And, like I said, I, I've been racking my brains over this guy for years, just trying to find just a nibble of information. And, uh, and I finally did. And you know how you go on the internet and like one day there's some information there and then the next day it's all kind of information? It's like constantly being updated. And it's just one of those things two months ago, you know, I throw the name into Google and all of a sudden I get a hit. And I'm like, oh my God, I've been looking for this guy forever. All I have is name, rank, and serial number. These, these other three guys, I mean, I can tell you cradle to grave about them. I know everything about them. This guy just eluded me, and so um, he was—he uh, wasn't from Atlantic Beach. Uh, he was from uh, Virginia, right outside Blacksburg, in a little town called uh, uh, Whiteville, Virginia, near Blacksburg in the foothills of the Blue Ridge. And uh, he was a carpenter, and his father was a carpenter. His brothers were a carpenter, and his young, his older brother Roy came to Atlantic Beach in 1922 as a carpenter and, and, and he was followed by another brother and they both were carpenters in Atlantic Beach in 1922 and I don't know if they worked uh, for B.B. McCormick, I'm not sure who they worked for, but they moved to Virginia because there was work here, maybe they worked for the Bulls, I don't know, but that's how Sullivan got here, uh, Sullivan got here, he also was a carpenter, so he ends up here the earliest thing I could find was his marriage uh, certificate, which was in uh, 1937. He was married at Atlantic Beach. He was 23 at the time. And I uh, married a girl, Ruth Simpson, who was from West Virginia. So he, he either, that, that's the earliest I found him. So he was here about 1937, was a carpenter. And then the war came. And if, uh, if you know, there, there was a combat team camp uh, in Atlantic Beach uh, from 1942 to 19, almost 1944. They just erected a historical marker by the police station this year. Uh, it's right by, you know, it's in Jack Russell Park facing Sandpiper and Plaza. And uh, that was like our only only military installation here in World War II. And what it was was a coastal anti-aircraft uh, battery. And it was right on Seminole Beach. And it had, it had big guns that they rolled up to. And, and we had these coastal batteries up and down uh, North Carolina, Georgia, everywhere, because we thought, you know, we were going to get invaded. We thought that once the U-boats came, they were going to come ashore, we needed to blow U-boats out of the water. And so Atlantic Beach ha actually had this combat team camp. There was a lot of army men here. There was a lot of uh, any, any aircraft uh, artillery, although we didn't really shoot at anything, we were ready. And, and I presume that maybe um, uh, that's where uh, Solomon got his idea to enlist in the army and become uh, part of the anti-aircraft searchlight battalion. And it's just like, like the name says, uh, a searchlight that was on the back of trucks in Europe that would be pointed up in the sky. A lot of times they were at airports, and those were ways that, that not only our planes could spot air, airports and air, and, uh, air, air, uh, air, sta air stations in France and whatnot, but it was also a way to spot the German planes. And so he was a truck driver for an uh, anti-aircraft uh, battalion in France um, in the, in the uh, northern, uh, northeastern eastern section of France near the, the Beausage Mountains. And this was uh, late, uh, late 44, early 
1945. And so by that time, you know, we're working our way into Germany. We're moving through the Rhineland. We're, we're basically unstoppable after the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, Germany has no tanks left. We bombed all their, their oil refineries. And they're basically sitting ducks. And the searchlight battalions, their job was to keep these planes up in the air, make sure that make sure they could spot them. And that was his contribution to the war. Uh, and Solomon died basically uh, not really in battle, but he died in, a, in, a, in an accident. And he was driving his truck, and for whatever reason, I don't have the information, but that's how he was killed. And like the cemeteries on Normandy, we had giant American cemeteries all over um, uh, Europe after the war and during the war. And uh, Solomon was buried in one of those, in, a, in just a beautiful cemetery in France. Um, and, um, and his body was never brought back. And I had just found, I just found that marker uh, online a couple months ago. And, uh, and it, it, he was born in the, the foothills of the Appalachians. And he sort of, he died sort of in the foothills of these mountains in France. So it sort of came a little bit full circle there. Uh, and even though he had two brothers here, for whatever reason, it, uh, I could never make a connection between these brothers in Atlantic Beach and Solomon. I also never find out, found out what happened to his wife. Uh, when they dedicated the uh, streets and the uh, park to these men, in, uh, in 1944, uh, the representative who accepted the plaque for Solomon was Pete Jensen of Neptune Beach of Pete's Park. And, and I'm thinking, maybe, maybe Solomon worked for Pete as a carpenter. Maybe that was the connection. When they, when they erected the monument and gave the uh, uh, plaques out to each individual family, uh, the, the Ahern family was there. The David family was there, um, and the, uh, of course the Bull family was there, but nobody was there for Solomon. So Pete Jensen accepted the award, and, it, it, and it's 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 weird because I looked in the uh, uh, the PDR, uh, PDR uh, the reference materials that we have upstairs, and we have what's called a pulp directory. And if you ever want to find out somebody who lived here at the beaches in the 40s, 30s, and what they did and where they lived. There's these little phone books up on the reading room, and they go alphabetically, and you can just find out where people live and what they did. They actually had their occupation. And so I found that the brothers were here. They lived off Mayport Road. They were, they were carpenters, and they lived here until like 1985. But for whatever reason, I don't know, they just were never associated uh, uh, with them in any way that I could find, but, but maybe they were. And so in 1946, after, after the park, uh, you know, three years after the park was named, um, this plaque was, uh, was cast. And if you've been to the park, you see it's a stone monument. And there's sort of like an amphitheater that, that it's on top of. And then you have this bronze, bronze plaque on. And, and, and also, we have, four, we have three streets. Atlantic Beach named for these guys. Bull got the park and the other three guys got streets. And Sturdivant is the street that's right behind Beach, Beach Diner. It runs all the way behind Beach Diner to Seminole. And it's basically where, you know, where the Nick Gates station is going to be. That street right behind it, that's Sturdivant. Ahern, Ahern is the street right at Ocean and I want to say, I guess, second. East Coast. There is an East Coast? Okay, East Coast, because Jack Ahern lived on the 600 block of Ocean. So his, his street is there. And then Bob David Street is a little farther up by Sherry, and it actually backs into Atlantic Beach Elementary School, and where the community Presbyterian Church is, and the Boy Scout, uh, the little Boy Scout Center, that's where David Street is. So if you ever pass those streets, if you're going down Seminole and you see Sturdivant and then you see David, that's what they're named after. Uh, 
people know you knew that or not, but, but that's, 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 that's actually a fact. Um, if anybody has questions, now's the time. Johnny, on, on Ahern Street, isn't uh -huh. there a plaque right there? Like the is it thing? still there? And if so, why, who put that there? Why is that there not one for David and uh, Well, Sarah? that's the thing. They each had a plaque, and each had a plaque at each one of their streets. And for whatever reason, Ahern plaque was the only one that survived. Uh, but uh, in 1946, they had a ceremony in April of 46. Each family got a plaque that they could put in the ground by the street sign. Apparently, there was just one street sign you know, in, that, in that time. And so Ahern is, is right on the corner of One Ocean, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it right there on One Ocean? And, yeah, it's right there. So you, you would just stumble across it, and, and you, you probably wouldn't know it. But that's the only one that apparently has survived. Yes, sir. Who was the lumber baron that lured the bulls to the thing? Yeah. You want to know his name? Yes. Okay. You know, I got it, but um, I do have it, and I'll go search for it, but I definitely have it. JC something. Yes, ma'am. Where is that memorial? Okay. So you know where the swing sets are in uh, in the park? Full Park. Full Park. You know, okay, well, Full Park is on East Coast Drive. Yeah, and Hill Bridge. Yeah, right right behind the theater, right behind the, the art gallery and the, the Civic Center, is a you've got tennis courts and then you've got a playground. It's right in the playground. And there's a, it's like a little amphitheater. It steps up maybe three steps, and then there's this there's rock monument, and the plaque is inside it. So the plaque faces the swings and the sand and all that. And it's right. it's sort of like out of place now with with all this kitty stuff, you know. And but uh, you know it's a memorial. I mean it's a memorial of these men. It's it's the only memorial to their sacrifice, and it's it's. Uh, you know, it motivates me to write stories about these guys. And, uh, and Jack Ahern is actually on the uh, on the uh, memorial on Second Street, or yeah, on Second Street and uh, uh, Beach, right there on the corner where, where we have the uh, Coast Guard, Army, Navy memorial right behind Sneakers. There's a memorial with all the World War II veterans who died in Jacksonville Beach. And for, for whatever reason, Jack Ahern's on there, even though he grew up in Miami Beach. I don't know how that happened. But he's on there as well. Anybody else? Yes, so Ahern was in the 504 and then went to the 509? No, that was David. All right, David. David, yeah. David was in what's called, it was called the 504th, but it's not what you're thinking. It's not the 504th of the 101st. It's the 504th Battalion, and then as they as they moved up and they would cadre one one unit after another, they made a separate unit called the 509th Infantry or 509th Parachute Battalion, and that became his unit all through the war. And and that unit basically ended with about 100 men. It started with you know uh, it was a battalion. So the battalion is three to four companies, so that's like 600, 600 men, and ended with about 100. I mean, they, they were all killed or, or got their place and went back. It was it's probably one of the most decorated units that nobody ever even knows about. Yeah, I noticed he was a staff sergeant, yeah. which he would have been a platoon leader. Yes. Well, he would have been a saw that in that list was the first sergeant, and they had a couple of techies in there. Mm -hmm. so was that like a head? It would have been a, it definitely was a headquarters platoon. That's why he was in it. He was a senior sergeant and the lieutenant was young. And so they needed some top top sergeants in there. And uh, uh, and so that's why he was in it. And that's why he was in that lead plane. He had been through a lot. He knew what, what, what to do when he got on the ground. And, uh, and uh, that was probably the reason. Thanks for all you guys coming out. Yes.
here, Cap Scout was listed as Boy Scout because all the Cap Scouts are Boy Scouts. Uh huh. There you go. I knew you'd know that. Thanks for all you all coming out. I really appreciate it. Good job. Thank you.
Fred Keener and I did that. He had the office. And the other side, he had the office of the lawyer. Yeah, office. And I mean, Jack's picture was in in the office. It's Johnny Keener and I thought I love it. Yeah, Fred's desk. I'll be sure. Yeah. Well, I've got. I've got that article, man. But you're still in shape. I like how you framed it. Maybe I'll get my. Well, they they did. Yeah. Um, I think no. Fred did that, and he donated that to the archives. Okay. Yeah, Fred did that before. That's in there right before me. Yeah. Well, um, he, the pictures. Do you have that? Uh, no, I've got I've got like the few. I've got one. I'm just gonna shake my increase a little bit.
Yeah, yeah. I try and see how. Okay. And you know, one of my picture is a 19 year old. Oh, yeah. Yeah.